He was a boy, and she was a girl. Can I make it any more obvious? Yes, Avril, what do you mean? I'm so confused right now. Why'd you have to go and make things so complicated? Can't guys and girls just be friends? We're gonna find out on today's episode of Man Talks Into Camera. This video is inspired by the eloquent video essayist Tara Mooney, who has discussed the friends to lovers trope in her video essay, Why Can't Fictional Guys and Girls Ever Have Platonic Relationships? It's a great video, and I've linked it below. Tara goes into detail about how oftentimes in media, creators will force relationships between friendships that just don't really make sense and aren't deserved. Bouncing off of that idea, we know that writers can ruin a perfectly good friendship with a nonsensical romance. But are there actually any good platonic relationships between hetero men and women in media? Fellas, is the friend zone maybe the goal zone? Why is it when something happens, it is always you three? One of the most iconic friend dynamics in media is the trio, or the small friend group that bonds over the course of the story. For people my age, I don't think there's a more iconic trio than the Harry Potter kids. Which Tara actually brings up in her essay. I'm sorry, do you really think I can believe that someone could grow up with Ron Weasley and end up wanting to boink him? He's like Hermione's annoying, dumber brother. I'm sorry, but I don't buy it. She makes a great point about how Hermione and Ron's relationship just isn't deserved at all. There's no chemistry throughout the first five books or movies, and then suddenly they just have chemistry for each other? Now that's a forced plot if you ask me. But surprisingly enough, while Ron and Hermione's relationship makes absolutely no sense on paper, Harry and Hermione's relationship is surprisingly deep. So here's the thing. Harry's not a good friend. Or person. Like at all. I mean, he's a rich guy who's never... I don't know, given money to his friend who has a large family and struggles financially throughout the entirety of the movies and books, and he definitely doesn't support his other friend's fight to free the enslaved elves that nobody seems to care about, and they all keep calling her crazy for even thinking that elves would want autonomy. But... Harry and Hermione are friends, and more importantly, they're friends outside of Harry and Ron's friendship and Ron and Hermione's eventual relationship. That's right, despite the absolute horror show that is Ron and Hermione falling in love, we get to see these moments of friendship blossom for both of them. Harry explicitly states that he doesn't have feelings for Hermione when he's pressed in the sixth movie. But I notice you spend a great deal of time with Miss Granger. I can't help wondering if- Oh no, no, I mean, she's brilliant and we're friends. But no. Well before her and Ron get together. And the friendship between the two of them grows a lot more visible, especially in the sixth movie when Ron has distanced himself from both of them when he's dating Lavender. And again in the seventh movie when Ron abandons them while they're on the run. There's one scene in particular that really exemplifies Harry and Hermione's close relationship with each other after Ron has left in the seventh movie. This is such an intimate moment between the two of them, and one that I don't think I've seen portrayed in media before or since. I don't know if there's a better example of a cishet friendship between a man and a woman that is as closely and as intimately portrayed as Harry and Hermione. It's a shame that Ron has to to be there to get together with Hermione in the end, but that's just a subversion of the classic trio dynamic. As is the case with Harry Potter, many movies and TV shows follow that same trio or small group dynamic. There's always a hetero relationship between two members of the group, and romantic tension runs rampant for these characters. Other shows of note would be Hannah Montana, I Carly, Ned's Declassified, Avatar The Last Airbender, Percy Jackson, How I Met Your Mother, Futurama, Friends. You're telling me not even the friends in Friends could just be friends? Honestly, I couldn't find an example where there wasn't at least one heterosexual couple that ended up together at the end. It's almost like the writers have like a relationship button when things aren't going so well. They're like, ba-boom, sexual tension, and then things just start cruising from there. It's baked into the formula like pumpkin spice into lattes. But these happenstance friendships aren't the only places where we can find really good examples. the friends from work setting. Workplace dramas or comedies like The Office, 30 Rock, Parks and Rec, and Brooklyn Nine-Nine. There are a couple of nuances in this category. Namely, there's often a power imbalance between employees and supervisors who are also friends. I would also like to stipulate that the friendship should exist outside of work and work-related conversation as well to count. One example that I think does a pretty good job of illustrating this dynamic is 30 Rock. In the show, the main characters Liz and Jack start out as pure enemies. Jack 
Jack is hired as Liz's boss and has direct influence over her show, a conflict of interest that is prevalent throughout the plot. Over time though, Jack and Liz become unlikely friends, sharing a relatively close bond that stems outside of their workplace and into their personal lives. The power imbalance between both characters combined with their unlikely friendship is commented on several times by other characters. Now I don't know who usually sleeps on which side, so I put a strawberry calcium chew on both night tables for you, Liz. Uh, oh, we're, we're co-workers, not, no, Ms. Edwards. No, no. Oh, I'm sorry, I just assumed that- That's quite all right. A lot of people are making wild assumptions today. Our relationship is purely platonic if Plato had an elderly shut-in aunt. These external opinions influence Jack and Liz's perception of their friendship and gives them pause, examining the merits of their friendship like in the episode Mrs. Donaghy. In this episode, Liz and Jack get married to each other accidentally. They married us by mistake? It is a clerical error that will be rectified immediately. See, this is exactly the kind of thing that happens when there is no order, no planning. Hitler and Martha Stewart would have hated that wedding. Of course, it's everyone else's fault that the minister thought the lady in the white dress and the veil was the bride. It was a men's tennis shirt and a government-sanctioned head net. You kept holding on to my arm. It's hard to balance on sand. Who wears shoes on a beach? Only Rocky and Apollo Creed during the training montage. Which spurs the idea of a romantic relationship between them. They both reject the notion. Though it is interesting to see both of them come to grips with the possibility of being attracted to each other. Are you each other's emergency contacts? Do you ever drink together at work? Perhaps while summarizing what you've learned over the day or week? Have you shared intimate details of your fears, hopes, and dreams, both personal and professional? Is this the longest and perhaps most meaningful relationship in your life? Do you often find yourself thinking the same thing and then saying it at the exact same time. I I'm apologize, sorry, Jack. Madam. At their core though, Jack and Liz recognize that they are both purely friends and do not have any interest in a romantic relationship with the other person. And that carries throughout the rest of the show. Similar to 30 Rock, Leslie and Ron from Parks and Rec follow a similar trajectory in their friendship. Leslie wins Ron over with her can-do attitude and Ron becomes friends with Leslie as much as Ron can gather the strength to be friends. Every year, I give Leslie the same present I give everyone, a crisp $20 bill. And every year she gets me something thoughtful and personal. It makes me furious. There are clearly no romantic feelings between the two of them, and they serve as foils of each other. Leslie being the bundle of big liberal government can-do attitude, and Ron being the Ernest Hemingway of libertarianism. We see many moments of Leslie showing her affection for Ron, truly caring for him as a friend. Happy birthday, Ron. Anne said you had a big party. Sombreros, karaoke. Yeah, I did that for Anne. Why would I throw Ron Swanson and Anne Perkins' party? And even some touching moments from Ron towards Leslie, showing that he can, in fact, care for another person. Leslie works under Ron for the majority of the show, so that power dynamic between employee and boss still exists. But unlike Jack and Liz from 30 Rock, there is no mention of romantic feelings between the two of these characters at all. Their friendship is never called into question based on the merits of their gender, and there are very clear examples of intimate connection between the two of them outside of work during the show. I'd say Ron and Leslie encompass a very pure, form of friendship in media as a whole, similar to Harry and Hermione, but there's something unique about Ron and Leslie's friendship that I don't think the other two examples have really captured before, which is that no one questions that they are just friends. They simply are, and that might be because they are so unbelievably different when it comes to their personalities and how they act. Really what it comes down to is how do the other characters in the story treat them? These are just a couple of the examples that I could find that I think are truly worthy of discussing, but the vast majority of friendships in media explore romantic and sexual themes throughout, even if it's outside perspectives looking at the friendship. So why does it seem so hard for media to have friends who are different genders just be friends? Welcome to hell, motherfucker! <laughs> I mean, if it's not capitalism, it's gotta be patriarchy, right? Social structures inform media, and media informs culture, which is why it's so important to have good examples of social interactions between many different types of people. The reason there's a severe lack of positive, intimate, and purely platonic friendships between men and women is because those tropes are informed by the patriarchal social structures that we live in. We assume that if a man and a woman are in a friendship that's really close, that they must be romantically interested in each other, even if there are no explicit signs that that's the 
the case. And we make these assumptions in media as well as real life. When Dumbledore asks Harry if he's romantically interested in Hermione in the sixth movie, there's an implication that because they spend time together, they must be interested in each other. Similar to when Liz and Jack are called out for Jack's preferential treatment of Liz's show, and the very informal way they talk to each other. Dumbledore's just grilling Harry like, yo, <laughs> you fucking? Cause uh, you need to get on that. If you're the chosen one, you ain't getting any, like what is wrong with this? <laughs> Back in my day, I was, I was getting dicked down all the time. Mm. <laughs> little saucy boy. Rest in peace. Our characters exist in universes that are inherently patriarchal, and therefore the rules of patriarchy are applied. People assume that most media has a more progressive view on social issues, and that can be true, but only to a point. It's commonplace to have characters of multiple genders and ethnicities collaborate and form bonds with each other, but rarely do we see the full dismantling of the structures that are built into the world that the characters live in. Just as social structures inform media, they also inform our everyday lives. They shape and confine how we act and view relationships. Men and women aren't socialized to have friends of the opposite gender. If women are friends with men, they may be labeled as a tomboy, a pick-me, or an enlog. Not like other girls. These labels insinuate that these people want to please men at the expense of women's social autonomy, or maybe that they're not romantically interested in men at all. And if men are friends with women, they're either stuck in the friend zone, but would choose to be in a relationship if possible, or are not romantically interested in women, usually phrased with more unkind language than that. Those assumptions are ingrained in us and into our media, and when our characters are forced to reckon with the fact that others assume that they're romantically engaged, it forces them to grapple with this idea of viewing their close friend in a different light. Calling back to Liz and Jack, this question of are they attracted to each other gives them a bit of an emotional crisis. They both know full well they don't see each other in that way, but having been forced to view the other from that perspective, they begin to recognize their admirable qualities. I don't think this is inherently a bad idea. To know someone intimately on a platonic level is to, in some ways, acknowledge the admirable qualities that others might find attractive. The issue comes when this recognition is forced upon them in an almost accusatory way. You can recognize the attractive qualities in one of your close friends without actively trying to pursue them. These external pressures to romanticize the friendship between two people of the opposite gender is so prevalent that it's even been parodied many times for laughs. Take Grey's Anatomy, for example. Meredith and Alex couldn't be farther from attracted to each other. But of course, there is an episode where they play into that impossible relationship for comedic value. For the record, I've never seen Grey's Anatomy, so this was just a gimme. <laughs> What's more frustrating about these structures in media is a lot of the time it's the audience themselves that encourages romance between characters. Shipping characters has been a popular topic of conversation for fans of all media for a very long time. And it's true that that has an effect on the media we see. If studio execs see more engagement around romance, drama, and sex, then they'll continue to provide more of it to satiate viewers. And though shipping can, and usually does, involve LGBTQ characters, most of the time it is hetero relationships that are actually represented. Take a minute to reflect on how we treat LGBT romance and sexuality in media and everyday life. If heterosexuality is the norm, then anything that deviates from the norm is focused on in a different way. There's a whole other conversation to be had about why people obsess over non-heterosexual relationships, for both good and bad reasons. But what a lot of people don't talk about is the casual way we just assume heteronormativity until proven otherwise. When young children of different genders spend time with each other, parents and other adults will often bring up the romantic part of their friendship. Mm -hmm. Is Lisa spending time with Ryan on the playground? <laughs> they must be dating then. This kind of talk reinforces heteronormativity and contributes to the over-sexualization that everyone experiences. And also it's cringe. These moments of implied sexuality and romance begin almost immediately when we start socializing as kids. And it only gets more pervasive when we grow up. We become so used to these close and personal moments being directly related to romance that we start to imply this stigma onto the media we watch. Remember that moment from the seventh Harry Potter when Harry and Hermione are dancing to Nick Cave in the tent? Did anyone think that they were maybe going to, I don't know, kiss or something? I know I kind of did when I first saw that, and it was a bit weird to watch. I was so unused to watching two friends of the opposite gender share such an intimate moment that I assumed they were going to take some sort of romantic turn in the narrative. It was also kind of uncomfortable to realize that I was primed to expect these two friends to push things to a romantic place with such a close moment like that. Obviously, that didn't happen. <laughs> 
thank God. But a lot of the time, moments like that do have romantic and sexual tension. My reaction to this very pure and innocent moment exemplifies how people are not socialized to have deep connections with others without pursuing some sort of romantic or sexual avenue, especially in heterosexual friendships. I know for men, there's a huge societal pressure for them to equate deep friendships with women and sexual intimacy. These sorts of platonic friendships with women that reach a deep level of connection are so foreign to most men. So much so that they misjudge signs of platonic affection to mean a sexual advance, even if it's not coded in that way at all. This, in turn, vilifies the idea of the friend zone as some liminal space where you're unable to access the sexual advances that you obviously want, and stigmatizes women as objects and symbols of status. There's this idea that men would sleep with any of their female friends if given the chance, and it wouldn't surprise me if most hetero men were socialized to believe that as well, especially with the social currency that sleeping with a lot of women brings. I don't have the lived experience to speak for women in this situation, and I haven't really come across an example where women act on these social cues without already having feelings for the other person, or that moment wasn't played out for comedic value. But what I've learned from talking with friends and listening to their lived experiences is that they tend to walk a fine line with their friendships with men. While they don't necessarily feel the same pressure to date and pursue these sexual encounters with men, pretty much the opposite, actually, they do have a fear of men trying to push their friendship into a romantic area, and then lashing out in emotional, verbal, or physical acts of violence towards them for being rejected. Funny, but not funny haha. -ha. Funny uncomfortable. Funny emotional violation. <laughs> Hilarious. I'm tired of this, Grandpa. That's too damn bad! So, are there good examples of cis het friendships between two people of the opposite gender? Yes. They're there. But it seems like we can't escape the notion or the implication of romance or sexual tension from really any character. It's a weird, cyclical place we found ourselves in. Audiences want to see romance between their favorite characters because that's the only kind of intimacy they've ever had experience with in their lives. Creators of mainstream media are bound by the social structures of capitalism and patriarchy to provide people with the same tropes that they've experienced and to not challenge the assumptions of the society they contribute to. And that leaves us with a pile of undeserved friends-to-lovers tropes and very few examples of good, intimate friendships between two people. So what can we do? Well, for a start, we can look inwardly at how we perpetuate these norms onto others. For my part, I've been trying to use more gender-neutral language when I talk about people's romantic lives, and I've also tried to stop making assumptions about people's close and intimate friendships. And that goes not just for the heteronormativity that we experience, but also for this over-sexualization that we feel towards the LGBT community. I think there's a weird focus that we tend to give on these groups of people, even in a good light, that could possibly be seen as a microaggression when we're over-congratulatory about them being in a relationship or being out and proud. I think what we really need to do is remove the inherent need to constantly sexualize others and put others into romantic scenarios when in reality we are just people just living and existing on our own and we can have full and well-developed lives outside of sexual and romantic connections. It does take some thought to recontextualize how we see others in this way, but at the end of the day, it is the least we can do. I'm curious to know your experiences when it comes to this over-sexualized nature of American and Western society. Have you felt this sense of judgment between you and a friend because you spend too much time together? Or have you felt pressure to romanticize a situation just because others are encouraging you to do so? It's definitely something I've noticed and it always makes me feel a little uncomfortable with the other person that I'm friends with when that happens. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this in the comments below and Thank you for watching to the end of this one. Stay tuned for what I've got next and check out the other videos I've done so far. I'll see you soon. Peace, love, platonic friendship forever. Yeah. New haircut. It's a new haircut day. We got new haircut, new haircut video.